Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Dalton. This week on the podcast, we've got Brad Waldron from Cali Protectives talking to us about helmets. Before we jump in, just a reminder, the Gravel Ride Podcast is sponsored by listeners like you and a select group of sponsors from the industry and outside the industry. We appreciate any contributions to the show's efforts at buymeacoffee.com slash the gravel ride. And when we do bring a sponsor on board, please make sure to check out their products because without their support, we couldn't continue doing what we're doing. With that said, let's dive right into my interview with Cali Protectives. Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am super stoked to talk helmets. It's interesting. It's one of those categories that I haven't covered on the podcast thus far, so I figured going to an expert and talking about it will give the listener a lot of value about helmet technology for gravel riding. Looking forward to it. Hey, so why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your background and how Cali was started? Sure. I was super lucky in a previous life career. I worked for an aerospace company working on military aircraft, so I was a carbon fiber R&D engineer, mostly on the process side, not on the material side. I was fortunate enough to work on the B-2 bomber, F-18s, Joint Strike Fighter, and then a few airplanes that had never made it, but just stuff you made it and broke it to see what we could do. And this will give you the idea of my age, but I was at Northrop Grumman in between the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, and they didn't want to put a lot of money in production at that time, but they want to put a lot of money into R&D. So I was just in the perfect place at the perfect time where you could almost do anything you wanted if it made sense. I One time, my boss walked in and said, DARPA is going to be here next week. Think of something. Go back to my desk. And I whipped out five different projects. And the next week, you sit down in front of these generals and you present these ideas. And here I'm in my late 20s, early 30s, uh, somewhere in there. And and they're like rubber stamping all of them. And oh shit, now I got to do them. So I got to build a $12 million milling machine and then just things like that. So that's where my, my real just try it mentality came from. When you hear, oh, you can't do that. And we'll get into some of the things that people told me we couldn't do at Cali. It's, Let's just try. And that's been my theme since. So I, I worked that and through some changes in life, I went to work for another aerospace company and didn't love it. So I was down in the Southern California area working there. And then I moved back up to Northern California where I was born and raised. And I was in R&D at this satellite company and it just wasn't everything I wanted. And lo and behold, there's this ad for the big red S in the paper. And so I put on my suit and went to my interview. <laughs> Nobody's wearing a suit. Got called back for a second interview and go, what do I wear? I, I, what I knew, I wore the suit again. So I guess it worked. They offered me a job as the humps and locks designer, something like that. And I was so happy to take my 25% pay cut to be in the bike industry. And and there I was. And on my first day, they said, hey, you know that job we offered you? The helmet guy quit. And would you rather that job? I'm like, helmets over locks? Hell yeah. But uh, the ironic thing was they they're like, at that time, Specialized was still assembling the helmets at, on the site and we tested all our own helmets and they said there's the test lab there's 10,000 helmets sitting over there that can't be shipped so you say they're tested and done and I, oh and by the way that the helmet technician quit at the same time and so I walk into this test lab with this equipment I'd never seen in my life and go okay what do we do here and fortunately uh, somebody who's become a, a, a good friend and who I trust in testing Dr. Terry Smith came and trained me how to run the equipment the best thing I did was I tested all the helmets at Specialized for the next year. I didn't hire another technician. So getting that lab experience and seeing how these helmets broke personally, not just people come and say, hey, look at this, here's your reading reports and stuff, it, it was a great launching point for me. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine just having your hands on that many tests to see how these helmets are performing just was like training by fire. I, I tell people frequently that, I'm a mediocre engineer. I'm really a better technician. I just somehow wiggled my way to get my degree. But mostly, I just love being in the shop. If you saw my office, it, next to me is a drill press. On the other side, a bandsaw. Just being out there with my hands is the way I work. And did you have a background in cycling when you were in the aerospace industry? I had started cycling with some friends and just around the LA area. And if I, I lived in, in first in Palmdale. When I first moved into Palmdale, I walked into a, a bike shop and this long-haired blonde guy walks up and says, can I help you? And I said, well, I'm new to the area. Can, 
tell me where some trails are. And he's, I'll pick you up Saturday morning at nine. Turned out it was Insane Wayne Crowsdale. So my first ride was with Insane Wayne. And he, uh, there's a long story, I won't bore you with it all. But he basically rode a wheelie up the fire road next to me. <laughs> and up and up. And, but we had a good time. We rode with Wayne a little bit and then got into riding there. And then I transferred down further into the deep depths of LA where you have to drive an hour just to get to dirt. A lot of people around me were riding and that's where I really got started riding was during that time. Yeah, right on. And you brought that to Specialize and obviously Specialize has a big riding culture down there in Morgan Hill. Yep. Yeah, we're actually about 500 meters from them. Our building is, you know, they actually have to pass us to get to their building. We, so we painted big ass Cali letters all over the building just, just to annoy them. <laughs> So then at some point you decided, I'm going to jump off and do this on my own. What Was there a particular market opportunity that you saw, something that you felt wasn't being done at the bigger companies? No, not yet. That's not really where it happened. At the time when I was a Specialized, so I had moved on from Helmets and eventually became the head of engineering at Specialized for everything, for bikes. Mostly what I concentrated on was the carbon fiber projects, the, the I worked on the tarmac and Robay, mostly on the layups and things like that. Other guys who had much better frame experience than I did, you know, the geometry. So I would go over to the factories and work with the, the, the carbon layups and things like that. And we would make it and break it. I still have tarmac frame number two. Doesn't look anything like what went to production. It had a split top tube. Who knew that was UCI illegal? But so my frame... People see it all the time. It doesn't say special. It doesn't say anything on it. So it's got carbon top tube and chains and uh, seat tubes. And and then the underbody is aluminum. So the idea was it was going to be a nice crisp feel of the aluminum. But where your body touches, you're going to have that forgiving carbon fiber conceptually feel. And uh, so I still have that bike when people see me out on it. I'm not a big roadie. I don't ride a lot on the road. But they're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Cause it's totally unrecognizable, but it's pretty cool. So the, I actually left specialized primarily because they were going through some transitions at the time. They had wanted to transfer a lot of the engineering to Taiwan. And I wasn't interested in that job. I had my first kid. I didn't want to travel, <laughs> did not want to travel at all. And so I actually resigned from the position. It was a great experience. It took me nine months to leave because I didn't have another job. I, I hired my replacement. I finished those two bikes and then just started consulting a little bit. So I consulted uh, a little bit with Truvada, worked on their first carbon bars with Jared Smith, their head of engineering, their first carbon cranks, things like that. And it bounced around a little bit. Then somebody came to me and said, we need a carbon fiber factory in China to feed these other factories. And I just quit specialized because I didn't want to travel. And they came to me and said, hey, can you help us start this factory? And I'm like, how many times a year will I have to come? And they were four times. I'm like, four, okay, I'm talking to a non-traveler now. I said, I, I, I can come for four times a year. I spent no less than 150 days a year for the next seven years. I just couldn't let it go. <laughs> Trying to get the thing up and running and, and working the way. And we made things like skid plates and pipe guards. KTM was one of our biggest customers. But one of our customers was a helmet factory. So they came to us to make a motorcycle helmet shell. And they, we, we looked at this thing and we made the shell, we sent it over and they knew I also had some testing background in it. So they were showing me these test results and I was seeing some things that I didn't like. Basically, I was seeing a double spike in G-force. And what that meant to me was inside your skull, your brain's just slapping around because you're seeing a double impact. That was happening because as the impact hits, the outer shell was so stiff that the G-forces spike up, then as the shell breaks down, they start to fall, then you hit the foam, and they spike up again. I'm like, okay, what's doing that is the gap between your foam and my shell. Let's get this thing tighter. Arai, for example, really prides themselves on the fact that they designed their foam and shell to fit so well. Not everybody spends that much time on it. Then I had this really, according to them, stupid idea. They said, why aren't you in-molding these like the bike helmet? And they're like, that's impossible. It's a processing problem. You'll never make it work. And that's where that, let's just try it thing came in. So we went in and we tried it. It took oh, a couple of years to finally get it to work, but we started in molding motorcycle helmets. So now you're eliminating that gap between the foam and shell. 
Then on top of it, you start to learn, oh, I don't need that much shell. I can thin the shell down because I've got the foam backing it up. And by the way, I don't even have to have as high of EPS density. I can lower that too. So now I'm finding out that when I have the impact, instead of having that, that double spike in G-forces, I've got this nice smooth curve that spreads the load much more efficiently. Then I got less shell, I got lighter foam, I got a much lighter helmet. I always like to tell people, I never start a project with a weight goal. I think that's not a good way to start a, a project that, that compromises safety in my opinion, but that process was helping us make a much lighter helmet, which in the end, is simple physics. Force equals mass times acceleration. Reduce the mass, you're going to reduce the force. So we started perfecting this process, showing these results around, tried to sell the patent. I did not, I was not looking to start my own company. That being a CEO, being in sales and marketing, not my favorite thing. We had a few people who were really close to buying it and then backed off. And then somebody who, somebody came along, a golden investor essentially, came along and said, you got to do this and I'll back you. And so I've got one silent investor in this company who's been nothing but amazing, uh, always allowing me to make safety decisions first over simply, what are your sales today? So you mentioned, that's amazing. You mentioned that you started with that motorcycle helmet technology. Did Cali launch with a motorcycle product? We did. And nobody cared. Literally, we, we went to the inner bike of Moto, which was Indianapolis. There was an Indianapolis motorsports show and we got our booth and I'm standing there my first day and you could hear the yawn from the industry. Nobody cared. Had the cutouts. You could see it. So the second day, I'm like, I've spent all of my money to get here. I stood in the aisle and made people pick up the helmet because it was significantly lighter than what people were used to. And you, know, you get the response like, yeah, it's okay. But I go, just put it in your hands. And if you don't want to talk to me, move on. And then you put it in their hands and go, what is this? And then through that, the rest of the next few days, I only had one guy actually put it in my hand and walk on. Everybody else said, all right, what's going on? And then we would explain what was happening with the in-molding process and why we could do what we could do and, and show the results of the testing. Was it always in the back of your head to move into the cycling market? I was more of a cyclist than I was moto. When I started doing skid, I, if I get involved with something, I want to get into the sport. So when we started making skid plates and pipe guards, I went and bought motorcycles. Started riding dirt bikes. Now I ride a Ducati and a and a and a Gixxer and and but cycling was definitely more my heart. That it, so it wasn't that I was necessarily looking to do that, but we had found a way to build full shell helmets that I believe, and I drink my own Kool Aid, that when you put that on your head using that technology, you are putting on a safer product on your head. So the next thing, of course, was to do a full face downhill helmet. So we did that and the, immediately the bike industry was more welcoming. Yeah. The moto industry is great, but it's complex. It's the distributors ha all have their own helmet brands. So in our industry, you've got the different distributors, BTI, KHS, QVP, all these different guys. They don't have their own helmet brands. When you start, start talking about moto, they all have their own helmet brands. If you think of it, Answer, for example, is open, owned by a company called Tucker Rocky. There's just the complexity of getting past the house brands where we were finding people were interested in our conversations. We'd go to Interbike and people wanted to talk to us. They wanted to hear about what we had. And, and that's where we really started taking off is when we were having these one-on-one -on -one conversations. It wasn't through any advertising we did. It wasn't through the, the talk. It was meeting people and just showing them what we did and answering questions. And that philosophy is still super important to us today. You call Cali today, you, you, you better get somebody on the phone. Somebody better answer the phone because that's our, we want to talk to people and respond. And that's an important part of, of who we are. So is it safe to say that the sort of signals the bike industry was giving you around the full faced helmet suggested, hey, we need to lean into this and, and create a range of helmets for cyclists? Yeah, it, it came into when you started talking to shops and what their needs are. It's one thing to walk in with one helmet. It, when you're going up against, I mean, let's be honest, you're going up against Trek Specialized, Giant, Cannondale, 
Scott. These guys all have all their products behind them and they all have helmets and there's incentives to bring in those helmets. You get a discount if you you bring that in. And then the only other, not the only, but the other big boys would, you know, are Belgiro who do have a complete range. That doesn't leave a lot of room for a lot of other people. So expanding your range into something that makes sense for a shop to carry. I still love bike shops. I still love walking in and smell the rubber. And, and still today, over 90% of our sales are still to independent bike dealers. Our, the amount that's sold online is small. And that's a whole nother probably podcast to talk about how, to, how that you know continues. But our main focus is still to, to maintain those relationships with those independent bike shops. Interesting. So when you develop that range, and I guess we can slip into the more road and gravel helmets that you guys have been releasing over the few years. What features were you leaning into at that point? You talked about how originally the differentiator turned out to be the weight and the technology around protecting the head in maybe a different way than had been done. Where did that go to for the road slash gravel helmets? Sure. Really what's, what continues to drive us is technology. We're always looking for stuff that can help us make the next step. And we started with a technology from a guy from Australia called Conehead, where you got the geometric shapes inside these helmets and they crush. The, the, but to get more specific to answering your question, some of the difficulties when you start talking about road helmets is ventilation is so important, right? So getting big vents, getting airflow through. When you do that, you have to really crank up the density of the foam to get the enough to stop the impact to, according to the standards. When you do that, let me put it another way, start with this. I believe all helmets are too hard. We're hurting people by the foam densities. We need to get the foam densities down. It's based on how the interpretation of the standards are, which are built to take the worst of the worst crashes. We're not doing enough to deal with where the majority of crashes are which, according to a study at the Imperial College of London, 80% of all bicycle accidents are below 106 Gs. Yet, all I got to do to pass a test and sell you a helmet is go to the test lab and make sure it doesn't go over 300 Gs. Now, 300 Gs is close to death already. How do we address both those big hits, but also the majority of those hits? And so, that's where that's where a lot of my time gets focused on is not specifically for a, a genre of, of, of helmet per se, but how do we lower the density of the foam? How do we put stuff next to your head that's softer? How do we start reducing impact at zero Gs? So now I jump back to the your question of how do we deal with the gravel helmets? Again, now I'm battling I got to put a lot of foam in a small space, which means I got to jack up the densities. What's cool, even though a lot of people don't know about Cali, we're known within the industry and, and the other helmet companies know each other, but getting a reputation as a, somebody who wants to try technology, we get people coming to, to us all the time saying, hey, you want to try this? And my answer is always the same. If it works, right? You bet, I'm going to try it. We were approached initially by Don Morgan, the physicist from Australia with the Conehead. Later, we were approached with a from a chemical company out of Italy that had this carbon nanotube acrylic-based material that they were trying to pitch as a multi-impact material. It didn't work as multi-impact, but it works. So now I combine the Coned and the EPS, and I'm finding I'm able to lower the density in the helmet that we're probably going to talk about, which is the grit, and so much that I was shocked at the first round of testing that I was expecting the typical results where I got to put way too hard the higher density of foam in a place that I don't really want to put it but by putting the right materials in and the right combinations I'm getting better results than than I expected and so did that sort of eureka moment happen early in the process and allow you then to pursue different elements of the design it, it, I wish it was that easy we actually Took, originally took that structure that I talked about and put it in an aero helmet. And the other way I can go with this stuff is I can, if, if you look at our Tava helmet, it's an aero helmet. I think I've sold a hundred of them, so I don't think you've seen it. <laughs> Probably, I, I think we have it on the Danish road team. So <laughs> unless you've been to Copenhagen lately, I'm not sure you've seen this helmet. But if you actually look at it and you look at cross section of it, it's one of the thinnest helmets you've ever seen, which was interesting for me as an engineer 
that I could actually get this thing to work and, and to pass the test. But because passing the test is not my goal, my goal is saving lives. I mean, be cheeky about that, but it really is what we give a shit about. We, we want people to get on their bikes and ride more. I want to get on my bike and ride more. I've been helicoptered off a hill before. We want that to happen. But I, when I went back to more realistic thicknesses and I could drive those foam densities down, now I'm getting the results I want, not only on linear impacts, but rotational impacts. And I'll skip back. We're doing a lot of testing in outside labs. So we took some of our helmets. We put in MIPS in it. We put in what we call Rion, which is our low density layer. That's material developed by a professor out of London. We put in like five different anti-rotation systems and we tested them against each other. And they all do an interesting job. A little better here, a little better there. Sometimes this system worked. Sometimes this system worked better. What consistently worked better was we threw in a helmet with extremely low density in it. It's actually a helmet that we sell in Europe but can't sell here because the density is too low. And that helmet consistently performed way better in rotational forces. So all these systems that we put in help, but what really matters is put softer shit next to your head. Let's get these things to be more crushing and more the pillows a little bit overrated, but just get that stuff that will crush next to your head. So when I'm talking about using the nanomaterial in the cone head structures, I'm basically talking about a way in a much smaller area to get the foam density down where it's really making a difference for you during that crash. Is there a way to articulate upon impact how a Cali helmet performs versus kind of maybe a major brand helmet in terms of how it crushes, how the materials work? Sure. I, I, I don't know how to say it against that. But I can say I'll go, you know, continue to go back to that foam density thing. Most people don't put as much energy as we do in, in trying to find how to get to that lower density. So basically, if that density is too hard, that thing you're going to smack and it's going to crack. Cracking is fine in a big hit in a helmet because that's releasing energy. But what I really want is I want it to crush and I want it to crush equally. And then by having those like those geometric shapes and that center, and it, it's actually, if you look at it, it looks like an Oreo because the nano material is white. You've got the black EPS around it. And as that outer side crushes, then you hit another material that's meant to crush and send energy laterally away from your head in those geometric structures. Rather than a smack and a crack, you're just seeing a, a progressive crack with multiple different materials there to, to help dissipate that energy. Yeah, that resonates with me. And it's, it's hard to visualize in a conversation at times for the listener potentially. But if you think about that, just I think the pillow analogy works for me where it's just progressively becoming more and more supportive as my head is unfortunately impacting the ground or dirt wherever I'm riding. And a lot of your impacts are small. And so you don't even get into the part that it has to really get harder and harder to stop that big hit. And that's my kind of my complaint with the way that our testing is that we're only testing for those big hits when we have a lot of hits, we're actually hurting people by doing it the way we're doing it. So we, we just got to look at it from all aspects rather than just this one test that we do in the test lab. Yeah. I managed to ring my own bell this pandemic on a gravel <laughs> ride. So it's resonating with me that having a look, it wasn't a, you know, a super devastating crash, but I had one of those impacts that I definitely rung my bell, definitely like maybe was not concussed, but needed to be escorted home by a friend. <laughs> Some level of brain trauma happened. It might've been light, but something happened. Yeah. It happens at, at, a, at a surprisingly low amount of G forces. Yeah. And, and that's why I keep talking about, we need to start managing those impacts from all levels, not just from the highest levels. Yeah. And you, you said, I think you said before, like the testing is just very, it, it tests one thing and it's easy to design around that one thing without really thinking about the athlete and the impacts. Yeah. Our tests are based on tests that were done in, in, the, in 1973, where we dropped cadavers on their heads and measured for skull fracture because we didn't know enough to measure the brain trauma. And at that time, it, we determined that it took 300 Gs, a helmeted head took 300 Gs to crack the skull. So that became where that 300 G's came from. It's, it's cracking your skull. And that was fine at the time, but we've moved on. We have better technology and people are trying. People are trying to make changes. People 
ask me about MIPS, and, and I always say, I respect MIPS. What Dr. Holder did was taught us about rotational forces, and we've learned a lot about those rotational forces. I happen to have a different philosophy on how to manage those than what MIPS does, because I want to start with something softer next to your head. They use a slip plane thing that is between your head and the EPS that needs to crush. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you know a number of listeners might be familiar with MIPS as a technology because it has been pretty heavily marketed and it's got a little yep. plastic frame inside the helmet that is designed to move a yep. bit. Yep, yep. Yes. And in my test, it works. It's a technology that, that works. Again, I, it, it, I think there's another way to attack it, and we do, by using something that crushes more immediately and then skids off the rotation. But I'll even go beyond that. Forget my systems, my low density layers versus MIPS versus some, you know, somebody else's. What I found in my tests at the University of Strasbourg and at Dynamic Research and other labs that we use, our own labs, is the lower you can make the foam, the lower density you can make the foam, the better it performs in rotation as well. So that so put softer shit next to your head. Keeps it's, coming it's back not, to that, Brad, doesn't it? Really what it comes <laughs> down to. It's not as simple as that, right? Otherwise, we just put something, we go use those old ProTech helmets that just had the soft stuff in it. Those bottom out, and they do bottom out at a low number, you're in trouble. So we have to, we're trying to manage all the impacts, and that's what's hard. I had somebody at MIPS tell me once, those are two different helmets. And I'm like, you guys invented the anti-rotation thing. We're smarter than that. We can do this. Just different philosophies. Yeah. So all this culminated recently in the Grit helmet coming to market. Is there anything you want to mention about that helmet that we haven't covered? Yeah. Grit, was a, there's pressure, not pressure. There's a lot of requests from our distributors, especially in Europe, to, to look at the road side of things. I'm, I'm a dirt guy through and through and we the grit got the name we actually started a, the name was called the nickname was the dirty road and we saw that as something that was much more cali than if we said oh we're gonna go try and put a helmet on a on a tour de france rider we got a couple helmets that are in that category the the, the uno and the grit the uno is like a hundred dollar helmet it's nice it was actually designed by Hildegard Mueller. Hilgard was the head of design for Giro for, he was at Giro for 20 years. I don't know how long he was head of design, but and he, and he freelances now and he helped us with that design because as you know, as primarily a mountain biker and one that likes gravity a lot, our line had le led, leaned that way for a long time. And then the grit was designed by Alan Okamura, who I've worked with quite a bit. And he's former Bell specialized. I worked on several specialized road helmets. But we really worked on these thinking more towards the gravel market than the road market because it fit us and who we are more than just saying, like I said, we're going we're gonna to go sponsor. Uh, I always like saying Sky because they're dead and they're not a team anymore. But it's just something like that and, and more to, to what we are. Yeah. And you certainly have some great athletes riding the helmets on the gravel scene. Former guest and friend of the pod, Amanda Nauman. Is a great friend of Callie's. She's just super chill and rides like a monster. You know, what she did at the, the XL just shows that and just a great attitude and somebody that's fun to just watch and see her progress. Yeah, yeah. It was a great racing debut for the helmet, for sure. Appreciate that. Yeah, cool. Brad, I appreciate the overview. I, I hope the listener got a bit out of this in terms of the type of helmet tech that they should be looking at. I think I'm probably guilty of not looking at my helmet enough and saying, hey, it's time for a new one, time to replace it. So this is a good reminder of this conversation to, to think about what's hanging in the garage. Yeah, you want to keep that thing fresh, especially if you're using it a lot. And it's not saying that it always has to be a Cali. There's other helmets. There's other people making helmets. They're out there like me that, that give a shit, that want people to do well. We have our philosophy. And like I said earlier, I drink my Kool-Aid. I think what we're doing is right on and on target. But yeah, you know, make sure that you're taking a look at what you're putting on your head. For sure. And I'll make sure the listener knows how to find you. I appreciate that. So that's it for this week's edition of the Gravel Ride Podcast. I hope you learned a lot more about helmets than you did prior to listening. I know I did. It's an area I probably should be thinking a little bit more about given the state of my current helmet. Thank you for spending a little bit of your week with me this week. If you're interested in giving us any feedback or joining our community, please visit The Ridership. 
It's www.theridership.com. Until next time, here's to finding some dirt under your wheels.